And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story of what might have happened to the first atomic-powered submarine. We call it Report on the X-915. We ask you to remember that it is fiction. So now, starring Stacey Harris, here is tonight's suspense play, Report on the X-915. Pursuant to Grouper's orders dated April 1st, 1952, I was detached from temporary duty with Naval Defense Command Washington and reported to Andrews Field for immediate transportation to New Haven, Connecticut. From there, I was directed to proceed without delay to Naval Base Charlie, where I was to report to Admiral R.L. Carruthers Commanding. After a routine flight, I landed at New Haven, Connecticut, and at 18.15, I reported with orders to the office of Admiral Carruthers. Yes, sir. Reporting for duty, sir. Please sit down, Commander. Thank you, sir. Did I? Uh, no, thank you, Admiral. Commander Richard, what do you know about Project Sailfish? Atomic big boat, a submarine, sir. Authorized by the Secretary of Defense. Begun May 1949, designated experimental vessel X-915. Cost about $50 million. What about the timetable? Oh, I believe the first atomic sub is scheduled for test runs in May of 1953. You've been reading the newspaper. And the file in the bureau, sir. Suppose I told you both new ships and the daily papers are wrong. Wrong? Deliberately wrong. Oh, I see. But since this base was activated, Commander, world conditions have changed. The Navy is no longer satisfied with the eight-hour day to 40-hour week. For this reason, we've been on a round-the-clock basis for almost six months. Project Sailfish is one year ahead of schedule. If we could publicly display our accomplishments. As a fact is, we can't. Not even to the Bureau of Ships? Not even to Congress. Oh, I'm, I'm beginning to understand why my orders are classified top secret. Commander, there are 307 men working on this base. Every single one of these men has been given the most thorough loyalty check possible. Every single one of them has been working and living behind the barbed wire for the past six months. Sir, you you suspect a leak? We're not sure. Two days ago, a convoy arrived at the base. Eight trucks. In one of those trucks was a Steinberg periscope. Yes, sir, I've heard of it. But not more than a handful have. Yet, when the periscope was being installed yesterday aboard the X-915, it fell to the deck, made completely inoperative. The cable on the crane lifting it into place snapped. Steel cable. Had it been cut, sir? No, it had not. In fact, the lab technicians assure me it simply broke under the strain. That cable was designed to support 100 tons. The Steinberg periscope weighs less than 20. All right. Now, there are two possibilities. One, that the cable was faulty to begin with. A manufacturer's mistake. I'm having Washington check that for me now. The second, that someone on this base somehow weakened that cable. Sabotage? Exactly. Commander, only one thing matters to me right now, that the X-915 completes the first trial run. They must proceed according to plan without interruption. That's why I requested Washington to send me a top man from O.N.I. Yes, sir. I'll open any way I can, sir. Uh, when do you plan to test the sub sometime this month? Not this month, Commander. Tomorrow. Twenty-one hundred hours, Tuesday, April 1st, 1952. I looked up Lieutenant Commander Stanley Linden, Chief Engineering Officer on the base. At his quarters, I was told Linden was at the docks working. Naval Base Charlie was surrounded by barbed wire, yet within the base itself was still a smaller area surrounded by more barbed wire, patrolled by an armed sailor every 20 yards. Even with my high-priority yellow pass, I was given the same check I'd received by any other visitor to this inner barbed wire area. For it was here, behind the wire that the United States ship X-915 was moored. The first atomic submarine. Floodlights covered the area and brought a glaring whiteness over the faces of the men working. But that wasn't what caught my eye. 
It was the thing that lay alongside the dock. The iron and steel monster that nestled against the pier like a giant pig. Here she was. Black, hideous, and beautiful. The X-915. 3,000 tons, $50 million. The Navy's first line of defense in any future war. The atomic age gone down to the sea in ships. I found Lieutenant Commander Stanley Linden just outside a six-by-six wooden shack near the docks. He invited me inside. The old man phoned you were coming down, Commander. Well, what's the story, Linden, about the Steinberg periscope? I wish you could tell me. How do you feel about it? Personally. Me? Yeah, you. Not official Navy. Sabotage? I see. And... And something more than just the periscope? I think so. Something else has happened to the men, the crew, the officers. Oh, could it be the speed up? It could be. 24 hour days, seven day weeks, even with three shifts, you get the feeling of rush. Get it done right now, get it done yesterday. Oh, uh, your crane operator. You think he might have had something to do with it? Thompson? Yeah, I said that. No. But then I could say that about almost every man on the base. They were hand picked, Commander. Not just stray workmen with know how, but the best. Nobody applied for a job at this base, not even me. We were all chosen. And the loss of your periscope doesn't postpone your trial run set for tomorrow. Commander, Washington didn't take chances with anything on Project Sailfish. Two periscopes were made. The second was installed less than an hour ago. What's your ETB for tomorrow, Evan? Mm-hmm. Zero seven hundred. Good. I'll be aboard. Zero seven hundred. Wednesday, April second, nineteen fifty-two. Captain Zio Unger, U.S. Navy commanding officer, sets special sea detail aboard the USS X-915. Zero seven ten, the X-915 left the berth under auxiliary power. Zero eight thirty, the X-915 was in the open sea. Now, hear this. All ship personnel. X-915 is switching to and will proceed under atomic power. I joined Lyndon in the control room. Engine sound good. Watch our speed, Lyndon. 30 knots, traveling at two-thirds. Cruise at 50? That's what the book says. 50 knots. 30 knots submerged. You've been reading the same book, Commander. <laughs> Today's test is speed maneuverability. Test table. Is that right? Right. Tomorrow we go for death. If we're successful today. Ten hundred hours. Captain Under gave the command a standard speed. The X-915 responded quietly and efficiently. We made 50 knots. Eleven hundred hours. Captain Unger gave the command a flank speed. He made good 60 knots. Nothing in the United States Navy could catch him. At 1,700 hours, the exercises were secured. At 1,730, the X-915 tied up alongside the dock at Naval Base Charlie. The big boat of tomorrow was everything the Navy had hoped for, and then some. Lyndon and I went up to the B.O.Q., changed clothes, and joined that Carruthers for dinner in his office. Lyndon reported, and I listened. If there was sabotage aboard the sub, it had kept itself well hidden. Everyone was pleased. The Admiral suggested I continue my investigations on shore the next day instead of joining Test Run Baker, and I agreed. Lyndon and I said goodnight to the Admiral and headed for our quarters. Zero 0700. Thursday, April 3rd, 1952. USS X-915 underway for depth test. 0800. I began an investigation of the dock area. 0930. I was summoned to the office of Admiral Carruthers, and the messenger said it was urgent. Never mind that. Get me the Secretary of Defense. I don't care where he is now. You get him. All right. All right. Call me back. Hand me the charge for you, Commander. Yes, sir. Oh. What? Well, why, Kathy's in a meeting. No, I don't care if he's with the president. You get him. 
I have a chart, Sergeant. You know the test area for today's trials, Richard? Circle them. Yes, sir. I believe this covers area store, Captain. Uh, yes, good. Hello. Hello. Yes, this is Carruthers. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, that's right. No, nothing's changed. No, sir. I want authority to put Plan Zebra in effect. Yes, at once. Thank you. Yes, sir, right away. All right, Commander Richards, here it is. Sir? The X-915 began depth test at 0800. She was to remain at various depths until 0900. It is now 940. She hasn't surfaced. What about radio contact, sir? Silence. She hasn't answered a radio message since 845. You think they're in trouble? I don't think so. Well, sir, the sub was equipped with any number of special emergency devices, including an automatic marker which would immediately rise to the surface should any trouble develop with the engines. No markers have appeared. Well, I don't know if she isn't in trouble. The X-915 is deliberately maintaining radio silence and is proceeding under her own orders to some unknown destination. Have her destroyer escorts lost contact with her, sir? The accompanying destroyers report the sub disappeared off their sonar screen at full submerged speed, 30 knots. Commander, there is only one possible conclusion. The X-915 has fallen into enemy hands. <laughs> $100, April 3rd, 1952. Admiral Carruthers office. The Admiral explains Plan Zebra. There are 15 plans covering each phase of the trial run to Project Sailfish. Now, each plan covers a particular contingency. Of all of them, Plan Zebra is to be used only in the case of extreme emergency. It covers the possibility of capture of the X-915 by enemy forces. Now, even though it's very unlikely, every possibility has to be provided for and the secretary gave you permission to put this plan into effect, sir? Correct. Within half an hour, a task force will steam out of three separate bases on the Atlantic coast. They'll rendezvous at uh, this point here. That's about 100 miles southeast of this base. Correct. When the task force is rendezvous, they will begin search able, which is the second step in Plan Zebra. And that is to find the X-915? Not to find a commander. The sinker. <laughs> $700. Destroyers escorting the atomic sub in a second trial run reported they had watched her dive and never regained either visual, radar, or sonar contact. This supported the Admiral's theory that the X-915 was not on bottom. Either the crew was composed entirely of traitors, which was unlikely in view of the exhaustive loyalty checks made on them, or some small portion of that crew, perhaps but a handful of men, had succeeded in taking over command of the vessel. 1130 hours. Admiral Carruthers established radio contact with the task force, which had now begun to rendezvous at Point Stork. The task force commander, Captain Elton R. Stevens, was designated by the code name Red Dog One for radio communication. Admiral Carruthers was using Pier Point Five on a wavelength unavailable to the sub. This is Red Dog One. This is Red Dog One. Hello, Pier Point Five. Hello, Pier Point Five. This is Red Dog One. How do you read me? Over. Hello, Red Dog One. This is Pier Point Five. I read you four by three. Pier Point Five, this is Red Dog One. Group is met at Point Stork. We are beginning search plan able. Over. Hello, Red Dog One. This is Pier Point Five. How's the weather? Pier Point Five. Wind 20 to 25 knots per hour. We could do a lot better with a calmer sea. Over. Red Dog One from Pier Point Five. Execute search plan able. Good luck. Over. Fair point five. Thanks, Skipper. Over now. Now we wait. Well, this sub's got a pretty fair lead, Admiral. We haven't got anything in the fleet that can make good 30 knots submerged. I don't know who's commanding the X-915 right now, Richards, but if he's smart, he isn't traveling submerged. Well, I don't understand your point, so what about air search? They'd spot him in a minute if he surfaced. The sub is equipped with Mark 10 radar. That means she can pick up a plane 100 miles away. By traveling on the surface, she can make good 60 knots. She'll have plenty of time to dive before being spotted by the air force. Yes. Uh, yes, just a minute. Commander, it's for you. Take it in the other office, please. Yes, sir. Richard speaking. Commander Richard, sir. Yes, who is it? 
sir, this is Lieutenant Hammond down at the torpedo shack. Yes, go on, Lieutenant. Well, sir, you remember you were inspecting the torpedoes down here this morning about uh, 9 o'clock? That's right. Remember you checked the cases containing the atomic warheads? You told me to report to you if anything funny happened? All right, Lieutenant, what have you found? Well, sir, that's just it. Uh, we didn't find anything. You see, one of the cases came open a while ago, and we could see it was empty. Somebody had removed the atomic warhead during the night. What? So wait, look down here at the torpedo shack, Commander. Perhaps you'd like to come down here and have a look for you. Never mind that, Lieutenant. You get some men. Search the entire storeroom. Search the base and check back with me. No, we haven't got time for that now. See why that second fighter group hasn't contacted our task force yet. Right. Anything, Commander? That was Lieutenant Hammond at the torpedo shack, sir. He told me he found the atomic warhead crates empty. Empty? That's right, sir. They're conducting a thorough search, but I don't imagine they'll find them. Those crates were marked torpedoes, but you know as well as I do what they actually contain. Yes, sir. Atomic warheads for the guided missiles aboard the X-915. They were scheduled for use in the final trial run. Quick, with those warheads, that sub could launch a full-scale atomic attack on any city on the eastern seaboard. Yes, sir. Well, right about that, not only has an enemy force succeeded in capturing our first atomic submarine, but now they've taken along the greatest single weapon the United States Navy owns. Admiral, Admiral, the captors of the X-915 pulled off one of the greatest coups in military history. Wouldn't you think they'd be satisfied to let it go at that? But, but this enemy went to the added risk of stealing a shipment of atomic warheads for guided missiles. Now, why? Why take that extra gamble unless you had plans to use it? I see your point. If they wanted the sub and were planning to make a run for it, they've accomplished it. But they included in their plans atomic warheads. Admiral, it's, it's my guess they're going to use those rockets in the near future. Why? Well, say today. I'll go along with that reasoning, Commander. Let's get to work. Thirteen hundred dollars. April 3rd, 1952. Admiral Carruthers and I studied the charts of the Atlantic coast. We agreed the nearest major target for atomic attack would be the city of New York. Figuring the effective range of the sub's missiles at 50 miles, we then sketched in the launching area the sub would have to use. Once that was established, there remained one simple detail. Stop those rockets from leaving the sub's deck. Admiral Carruthers had a plan. All right. Now we've settled on the probable site of their attack. That becomes our bullseye. Around that bullseye, we draw a circle ten miles out. And like this. Then another circle. It's another ten miles. And still another. Until the outer circle around the bullseye measures a 100-mile radius. In other words, sir, our outer circle is out of the atomic sub's radar range, right? Exactly. Now, calculating their speed and course, we should arrive at their ideal launching site, the center of our circle, just about the time we're able to complete a ring of ships 100 miles out. With the X-915 in the center. Except if we close in, sir, the sub will submerge and escape under us. We won't close in. Sir? We'll send one ship in toward the bullseye, alone. The sub will pick up contact. Oh, and they'll figure for a stray vessel, not enough of a threat to frighten them, but it will force them to shift their position before launching their missile. Correct. And it also forces them to travel submerged, and that negates the 100-mile radar. Right. Now, we send in another ship. The sub shifts position again to another segment of our circle. Then we send in still another ship. We're constantly narrowing their corridor for attack. And then when they do break service in the last remaining segment to launch their missiles, we're surrounding them. We hope to God we are, Commander. Hello. Red Dog 1. Hello, Red Dog 1. This is Pier Point 5. Over. Hello, Pier Point 5. This is Red Dog 1. Over. Discontinue search plan ABLE. I repeat, discontinue search plan ABLE. Over. Uh, Pier Point 5, this is Red Dog 1. Would you repeat your last transmission? Red Dog 1, this is Pier Point 5. I repeat, discontinue your present search plan. The following plan supersedes all previous orders. It is to be executed immediately following this transmission. For five minutes, the Admiral gave facts and figures. And at 1600, the plan was in effect. The Admiral clicked off his radio transmitter and we stared at each other. We had to pray for one thing. That whoever had captured the X-915 was now proceeding to the launching area and once there, would attempt to destroy the city of New York. 1715. The sun was low outside the Admiral's office. The sun was low outside the city of New York. Sundown is made for submarines. It is their witching hour. Their time for attack. 
Harvey. Yes, thank you, sir. What time is it? It's exactly 17.20, sir. Beautiful sunset. Yes, sir. Used to seem like this off on a wheat talk. Pacific. Mm, that's where you have the sunset. Linden served in the Pacific. Yes. What happened to Linden and Captain Unger? Unger was a classmate of mine at the academy. He didn't sell out. None of them sold out, sir. They were shanghai. You can bet on it. And they're all aboard that sub right now. Linden and Unger and a lot of good men. The sub is our job to sink. F-1-5, this is Red Dog 1. Right, should be at the launching Seven point five to Red Dog 1. Go ahead. Over. F-1-5, we have completed the ring. I repeat, we have completed the ring. Over. Red Dog 1, Fair point five. have you sent in your first messenger? Fair point five, Red Dog 1. Roger. Over. Red Dog 1, proceed with plan. Please advise any contact. Over and out. The Admiral sat down behind his chart cluttered desk. The wind-stained lines of his face were more noticeable now. Together we waited. Fair point five. And then again, stop in messenger. Rain closing. No contact as yet. Over and out. Ten minutes. Twenty minutes. Thirty minutes. Standing in third messenger. Closing to bullseye. No contact. Over and out. One by one, the single ships were slicing across the big target that we had drawn on our chart. Each ship slicing in closer toward the launching area, forcing the enemy we had never seen to change plans, change positions yet not frightening him enough to make him forget his attack. Airport 5, Red Dog 1. Sending in 7th messenger. No contact as yet. Closing within one zero miles of bullseye. I repeat, no contact. Well, one way that's good, Commander. At least we can feel certain the sub hasn't surfaced. Well, we're safe from the radar, then. Our sound range is only 10,000 yards. I'm going to order the task force to patrol that range. Red Dog 1. Take position five miles from Bullseye. I repeat, take position five miles from Bullseye. Over. Red Point 5, this is Red Dog 1. Okay, Skipper, that's as close as we can get. Report to me every minute. Yes, sir. We're closing in. Over and out. He's worried. Well, I don't blame him, sir. Well, he's only worried. I'm scared. Suppose a sub headed for Siberia. Well, sir, then we were out of luck anyway. Point five, closing to ten thousand yards. No contact. Destroyer group is. Air Point five, destroyer group off my port bow has sighted enemy. I repeat, destroyer group has sighted enemy. The sub is surfacing. Air Point five, you hear me? Over. Red Dog one, I hear you. Over. Enemy has surfaced. Destroyer group opening fire. Dive bombers coming in. Bomber taking his back. The sub is still coming. Dog one. Red Dog One, come in. Red Dog One, this is Pier Point Five. Come in. Red Dog One, are you receiving me? Pier Point Five, this is Red Dog One. I am receiving you. Air Force and destroyer groups have attacked. The X-915 is sinking. I repeat, sir, the X-915 is speaking. Proceeding to pick up survivors. Over. Red Dog 1, this is Fear Point 5. Well done. 
Over and out. Ten hundred dollars. April 4th, 1952. Task Force Able reported in to Admiral Carruthers. Of the crew of 40 men and 8 officers, there were 11 survivors. Captain G.L. Unger and Lieutenant Commander Stanley Linden were not among them. But the 11 survivors told us the story. The X-915 had been captured during maximum depth test. It had taken only eight well-trained enemy agents to do it. Where did they come from? For one year, they'd been trained for this assignment. All eight were seamen with brilliant naval records. All eight had been living and working within Naval Base Charlie for over six months. What of the Steinberg periscope? Why had they sabotaged it? Well, the answer was they had not. Just as the lab technicians had told us, the cable had broken from strain. A manufacturer's mistake. A mistake that brought about an investigation that saved the city of New York. End of report. in tonight's presentation of Report on the X-915. Be sure to listen next week to radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense.